Okay, thank you very much, Marianne, and thanks, Koei, for running this. Um, I am uh, at the Department of Neuroscience at UCSD, and I also have to declare my conflict of interest. I am the co-founder um, and CEO of SciCrunch Inc. That should not be any conflict here, but um, I just wanted to make sure that I disclose that. So I like to go through some definitions because this field, this um, you know, aspect of science is not really well enough set yet that everybody understands what the definitions are. Um, but what you can imagine uh, is that this is less reproducible and this is more reproducible, right? So you're kind of looking at the sorts of things that improve reproducibility or, or certain findings from something that one lab might see and be able to reproduce in the, you know, in that particular lab, uh, all the way to things that will work in say an undergraduate laboratory where there's lots of students not doing this quite well enough. Um, so if you think of this as cooking, this would be at the chef level, and down here you would be you know making brownies which every you know five-year-old has done right from a from a box so um there is this this notion that transparency right so transparency is the availability of data information within that paper and if you break this down a little bit further there's this kind of methods reproducibility and that's a lot of what i'm going to be talking about today um, that methods reproducibility is, you know, here's the stuff that you need for this particular experiment, and here's how to do all of the steps. This is how to complete the steps so that you can get it through this experiment. Um, then results reproducibility, I mean, here we're really looking at something where um, you're going to be able to re replicate the same result um, based on either the same methods or potentially slightly different methods. Inferential reproducibility is making claims about these, um, these results, which are similar strength from different kind of um, analysis or replication or reanalysis of that data. And robustness and then generalizability, this is where an experiment really starts to stand the test of time and the test of different laboratories, the test of different conditions, et cetera, um, with you know, that final point uh, of something that is so robust that it's fully generalizable. And if you want to understand what a clinical setting might be able to, um, you know, to, to work with, it's, it's experiments that are robust and generalizable. That is what you need in order to actually move that experimental finding that might be very interesting from a single paper into a clinical setting where you're going to be interacting with lots and lots of different kinds of people. You know, the, the protocols are never gonna be as good Right as um, uh, as the uh, you know as the uh, initial set of of mice or what have you. Okay, so here is uh, a, a slide, a set of slides that I uh, I borrowed from uh, from uh, the Camerati's group in uh, in Edinburgh. And what they did is they actually looked at stroke, and I I don't have a good example for this um, from the DKNet world. But this is a different disease, uh, and what we're trying to figure out here with this particular study, and this is meta-analysis, um, which is an analysis of a whole bunch of papers in a particular field. And uh, what they looked at is papers that describe over a thousand interventions in stroke, and then they're going to uh, you know, pull this down and say, okay, there's over a thousand of those. They're both in vivo and in vitro. 600 of them were tested in vivo. So they're now actually going into animals. Almost 400 were actually effective in vivo, which is great. So they're, they're helping these animals um, get over stroke. 97 of them were tested in a clinical trial, right? And then there's only a problem because 96 of them failed in clinical trials they failed that robustness, that generalizability. This is over a 10 year period. And over that period of time, there were two additional uh, interventions that actually made it through without the, the um, animal pipelines. So the problem here is that this is really not fitting the mantra of, uh, you know, of, of uh, uh, new development, right? We want to always fail early, fail often. And in this case, each one of these clinical trials 
each one of these 97 clinical trials is patient lives, right, that, that were affected. Um, it's people that did not get a treatment that was effective. And that is a serious problem. So what I'm going to now try to do is try to disentangle some of the reasons why these things might be failing. So in that, uh, in that vein, I'm going to tell you about a little, um, uh, a little story about a psychologist who enlisted 12 graduate students to help him on this, uh, in this experiment. And it was a five-day experiment. Uh, the rats were uh, asked to run and learn a T-maze, elevated T-maze. This is a very standard procedure inside of, um, you know, psychology studies. Rat in a maze, essentially, is what you're looking at. Um, so there was a dark arm uh, here uh, shown with A. There's dark uh, arm, and then there's a light arm here shown in B. The dark arm was always reinforced with food. So very simple. And then uh, the graduate students were told that are, were given two, two groups of rats. Uh, there were maize right, uh, bright rats and maize dull rats. Um, so, you know, they're, they're looking at these. And so they were supposed to break this down and uh, they actually did this, you know, diligently. And the maize bright group um, did very, very well over the, the five days. You can see their learning is very good here. Uh, the maize dull rats also learned um, but not nearly as well, especially here on day five, compared to, uh, you know, compared to the maze bright. And then tragedy struck. So the tragedy here is that the paper was published, and it turned out that, in fact, there weren't two groups of rats. There was only one group of rats. See? The albino rat. In fact, the experiment was whether the students would actually come up with different answers if they were conceptually thinking, in fact, that there was a difference. And the answer is absolutely. These rats, these maize bright rats, for some strange reason, did so much better running this very simple test. That is called experimenter bias. And there are actually four different groups that you need to blind. Um, so one of them is the experimenter, one of them is the person who's doing the analysis, because that also tends to um, be problematic, because you will talk in a second about some um, uh, statistical issues. Um, but, you know, there are, so when you, when you actually look at the study that's being conducted, which is uh, a clinical study, right, everyone is blinded. The patients are blinded. The nurses that are administering whatever drug it is, they don't know if that patient is getting an experimental or a control substance, right? In fact, I was part of the AstraZeneca study. It was the phase three for um, one of the vaccines. It hasn't been approved yet. Um, and it turned out I, I became unblinded to determine whether um, I had already gotten the vaccine or not because my uh, workplace said, okay, I need to now be vaccinated. And um, so I had to become unblinded and it turned out that I was part of the control group and that's fine. If you're part of a, a, you know, a big study, there's going to be some people who get the placebo, right? And the placebo doesn't do anything. It's not, it's not the active version of the, of the drug or the, the intervention. So those are the groups of people that you need to actually blind. Everybody needs to be blinded. I didn't know if I had gotten the placebo or if I had gotten the control. And I couldn't know that because otherwise it would not be a valid test of that particular um, thing. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about how many subjects, how many mice do you need? How many cell lines do you need or, or cells do you need in order to actually show um, your particular effect. So um, the NIH Center for Scientific Review actually put out this slide as part of um, some of their slide decks about um, underpowered studies. So small studies with very few subjects, if you only have one or two or three animals per, per group, you actually are going to suffer from a couple of statistical anomalies that you need to really look out for. Some of them are more false negatives. Some of them are more false positives. 
there is definitely a reduced predictive value. So we've already heard, I think, from Mariel and a couple of others talking about, you know, doing the same experiment by multiple parties, right? So that often involves doing more animals. And we, we also want to understand that that's not always an easy thing to do because th these are animal lives um, that are going to be cut short because we have to um, you know, do this, this more robust experiment. So you kind of have to balance, you know, how many lives are we going to be willing to sacrifice to get a, an answer for this versus, you know, are we, a, are we going to be able to get the right answer? And so um, the other thing that I wanted to really stress here is that there is the notion of actually this, this problem called the winner's curse. And the winner's curse is the lucky scientist who actually finds something out, makes that discovery based on an, a, a, an N of one or two, where this looks like it's working. And then that result actually biases the scientist into thinking that they know what's going on before all the data's in, right? Before all the data is in, you don't know the answer. And yet, if you look at that previous study, the fraud study, what you're seeing is that when you see bias, when you have, and that bias comes in in the fraud study at the very beginning of the study, but if you're in a couple, you know, as a couple of subjects in and you only have a couple more to go, you're actually going to be biasing the rest of that study. So um, this is a, a serious problem and it, it definitely will affect um, your studies. So the way that you get around this is that you try to figure out how many subjects you're actually going to, to need. And the formula for that is a power analysis. The power analysis is listed right there. It looks an awful lot like a t-test turned on its head because largely it is a t-test turned on its head. Um, I ended up deriving that actually in my stats class. Uh, in grad school, and it was fun. Um, no one else thought so, but it was fun for me. Um, now, if this looks like Greek to you, there's probably good reason for it, because there are some Greek letters in here. But if you're like, I'm a biologist, I'm not really sure what to do with these fancy statistical formulas, that's fine. Because there are these buildings on most campuses. Now, you may not be accessing a particular campus, but if you are accessing a particular campus, one of the things that you can do is you can find one of these buildings. This is the one at UCSD campus. Um, and this is the one at University of Puerto Rico. And this building holds inside of it statisticians. And there is a position in that, in that math department that is the statistician on call. And every university that I'm aware of actually has this position. So if you have trouble in your lab or with your paper or when you're summing these things up, you can actually reach out to a person who will help you, who knows how to implement these formulas. So if you're having trouble, you can actually go to the statistician on call at your campus and say, hey, I think I'm doing this right or I'm not sure if I'm doing this right, can you please help me with this aspect of my paper? Very useful position to, to reach out to. And by the way, I took lots of statistics. I'm probably better than some of you guys, at least, in statistics. And you know what? Every single one of my papers recently, I had to go to the statistician on call. I actually, I now just email him freely um, because I don't know that I'm making all of the assumptions that I need to be making or I'm making too many or too few. Statistics is hard. Um, and so I have to go to this person and say, I thank this person for helping me with my stats. And that actually also really helps um, helps my papers in review because we've never had a question um, for one of our papers because in the acknowledgements it says, we thank Dr. Anthony Gast, the statistician on call at UCSD for helping us with our statistics. And that you know is a pr preliminary statistical review of that work that is very useful. Um, okay. Anita, I just posted okay. just a, a point in the chat. When is the best time to consult with a statistician? Huh. <laughs> the best point at, to cons, uh, consult with a statistician is either when you're setting up the study 
or when you're finishing up with the study and you have already collected um, a lot of your ex uh, experimental data. But I would start with the very beginning, starting out the study. This is how I think I'm going to set up my groups. This is how I'm going to blind my investigators. This is how I'm going to blind my subjects. This is how I'm going to blind my analysis. I already know that. I have written this out. There's my protocol. And now this is how I'm going to pull out my statistics. Yeah. So when you talk to statisticians, the things that drive them crazy about biomedical researchers is that they only consult after the data are collected and they and any problems that there will be in your design or um, you know, the, 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 the conduct of the study is too late to fix. So uh, they recommend that before you do your study, you go and consult with them and say exactly as Anita said, right? This is how I'm planning on doing it. Mm -hmm. Are there problems? Because they may be able to recommend, you know, certain type of statistics that would be very good for your type of study that work better than your, your average t-tests. But in order to do that, you have to power it appropriately, make sure that the experimental design is done appropriately and document. So that's always the best time to consult with a statistician. Yep. And there's your power analysis. So if you can't figure out how many subjects, which you know, I'm going to guess that at least some of you can't figure out how many subjects you should be using. There's a lovely formula for that. That is a great time to talk to a, a statistician. So um, thank you, Marianne, for bringing up that point. Absolutely important. Um, here's another statistical bit that um, I really like to, to talk about. This is the garden of forking paths, right? And what this is, is a, a particular experiment that got set up initially. And that experiment was um, handedness um, experiment, you know, right, left-handed, um, ADHD versus typical. And so there was the first kind of um, experimental setup here. And this might be where the power analysis was done, right? But then that didn't give clear results. So the experimenter actually did the next study and set up yet another study and set up another experiment, right? And then that didn't really give clear answers. And then another experiment was set up and that didn't quite give the kinds of clear answers that it needed to. And finally, a fourth study was set up and that gave a nice clear answer. Well, the problem here is that if you set up four different experiments all in a line to find out the answer to your original question, you're losing power all the way down. And when people set up this power analysis, they actually don't reset it up at the very last portion of this. So this is how most studies are done in science. And these are preliminary because now what you have to do to find out if this effect is real, this your final effect is real, you have to reset up that study. You have to get the power analysis done for that particular study so that it becomes your branch point that you're actually looking at. Because you can imagine each one of these, if you say, oh, I've got a 5% chance of chance of seeing an effect. And now that chance is multiplied by how many different options here that you could actually be having. It's multiplied a lot. So your original power analysis is not sufficient. You need to reset this study and find out whether this is accurate. So um, the, um, the uh, statistical power to actually detect this false result is not usually being adjusted and it's not usually being adjusted properly. So, um, this uh, lovely commentary um, that was published um, really talks about something called p-hacking, right? And p-hacking, does anybody actually know what p-hacking is? So we, we did this as a, you know, in my, in my stats class in, in graduate school, actually, this is what happened. Like um, the instructor came in and with a giant bag of M&Ms, which I'm always very happy about. Um, and then he threw it out on the table and then everybody like picked some, some M&Ms. And then he was like, okay, let's figure out how to get something significant out of this, you know, random bag of M&Ms. Um, and we did, we were always able to come up with a statistically significant result. That's p-hacking. It can be done. It doesn't mean it should be done, right? And if you are not aware that you're doing p-hacking, then it's a real problem, right? So essentially, 
you don't want to analyze and reanalyze your data for your paper in order to, um, to do this. What you want to do is you want to set up the analysis at the beginning of the study. You want to write that down, run it by a statistician, and then do that analysis after the data's in. And if it says there's no effect, you know what? That's the right answer. It may be that your study says there is no effect here. And in fact, that's great. If you publish that, you will be among very few people, very few studies that actually get published with null effects, but they are really important because the literature is full, full of statistically significant effects. But in fact, then when you run into um, you know, a clinical trial, most of them are, there is no effect, right? Remember a study um, from the, the beginning of these slides, which is uh, in stroke, most of those effects were not real. Okay, so here the American Statistical Association really did re release this statement on significance and p-values. And p-values, um, you know, p is less than 0.05, right? That should never be a substitute for scientific reasoning. You have to have ideas outside of just there is something significant with a number. There needs to be something that's greater than just the statistics. Okay, and this is fun, just talking about statistics and how they can, you know, lead us into so, so many interesting, interesting uh, avenues. So um, this, this was a real study, it was published. Um, and let me tell you the story of this study. So the story of the study is that there were some postdocs that were ready for a, you know, a, a, a beautiful barbecuing session. And one of the postdocs came into the lab uh, with a fish from an Atlantic salmon from the uh, from the fish market, and uh, the rest of the postdocs were just finishing up their experiments uh, on their F, you know on their MRI scanner on their fMRI scanner, and uh, these experiments where you stick the patient in the scanner, and you have them walk uh, through a bunch of um, uh, uh, scenarios where people are seen either laughing or crying or angry or what have you right. And so what these, you know, postdocs did, because they're good, they're good scientists, is they, um, they looked at the fish and they looked at the scanner, and they put the fish in the scanner, right? And um, now I will tell you that this is um, a dead fish, right, that they're going to eat later. Now, what they did after they ran through the entire protocol is they found significant brain activation. So the, um, the, this thing was actually published in, uh, in the uh, Journal of Serendipitous and Unexpected Results. Um, and the, under the title, The Neural Correlates of Interspecies Perspective Taking in the Postmortem Dead Salmon, an Argument for Proper Multiple Comparisons Correction, right? So basically, the stats are wrong of what they were doing inside of this scanner. They were so wrong that they actually showed that there was an effect, a significant effect in a dead fish. Obviously wrong, right? And so for that, they they won the um, the 2012 Ig Nobel Award for neuroscience for basically showing us how um, how statistics can fail dramatically. Okay, so what about sex? Sex of animals, right? Um, it turns out, and you guys are not unaware of this, right, um, that sex is a biological variable. It is very important in clinical care. In fact, when you have uh, adverse reactions, when you have clinical trials going wrong, they tend to go wrong in women way more than men. And Sex is something that affects cellular physiology, metabolism, many other biological functions. However, however, a study by Beery and Zucker actually showed that in all kinds of different parts of biology, male rodents were only were used 80% of the time in animal studies. So all of that stuff going into the study is actually only being based on male animals. And what comes out the other end is a clinical trial that includes both men and women. And guess what? More of those clinical trials fail because of female patients than because of male patients. 
Coinkydink? Hmm, probably not. All right. So Henrietta Lacks, um, you have all probably heard of HeLa cells. Well, guess what? They come from this woman named Henrietta Lacks. And those are her cells. Um, every one of the cells that you might be working with came from a patient or it came from a rat or it came from a monkey or it came from someone. That original donor had a sex associated with it, with, you know, them. Um, so it's important to understand that the, the tissue you're working with is not sexless. And a lot of um, researchers who work with um, cell lines don't see the sex because I mean, it's a cell line for God's sakes, right? But no, it actually, it came from a patient. It has a sex associated with it. And I have seen, um, thank goodness it's a very old paper, but I did see a prostate cancer paper where a lot of the controls were actually being done on HeLa cells because they're really easy to grow. Really bad optics, right? So we don't wanna do that um, because prostate cancer, you know, Henrietta Lacks, I know, some things about her, but one thing is for sure, she didn't have a prostate. So, um, okay. Is this a problem? This kind of insufficient reporting um, of these kind of methodological approaches in preclinical studies? And the answer is yes, at least in uh, 2007, which is when this particular study was published. Um, things like blinded assessment of outcome, uh, sample size calculation, where they're essentially absent across and then randomization of how do you split up the subjects into the different groups? Do you randomize that properly? In you know, nearly 500 publications that were looked at um, in this, uh, you know, across multiple types of, of um, studies, these things were not being done. So in 2007, there is almost no evidence that people are actually leaving in the scientific paper that they did these things properly. Now, that might be a paper problem. It might be an experimental design problem. And um, we actually looked at this um, across the entirety of the open access literature. We actually um, looked at these kinds of things like blinding, randomization of, of um, subjects into groups, power analysis. And we looked at that um, in the percentage of papers. So here, for example, blinding was being done in 2008 um, in about 3% of the papers, which kind of aligns with the 2007 and before results. And that rises all the way to 10% in 2019. We can do better. I think this is something that's definitely addressable. Um, the uh, um, randomization actually did, did increase quite a bit over these 20 year over the 20 year period here. Um, and uh, the reporting of sex, this is not even saying I'm only using male animals, right? It's just not even reported in many studies. Um, so it was reported in about 20% of the studies in um, 2008 and um, in about, uh, you know, 38% of the studies in 2019. Again, we can do much better than this. And I am sure that you are going to be on the front lines of, of doing better at this. So um, another project that um, my group ran is uh, we looked at all of the COVID research um, that's coming out in, in preprints. And we actually check, checked and tested whether randomization, blinding, power analysis, et cetera, were actually um, present in these papers. And unfortunately, the, um, uh, the uh, unfortunate portion of all of this is that uh, these variables are found less percentage of the time or lower percentage of the time than even the published papers. So um, this is not being routinely done by laboratories, and it really needs to be. Okay, now, are these things that only I care about? Turns out, no. In fact, there's a lot of guidelines. There is a, a set of guidelines. One is the ARRIVE guidelines. This is for animal experiments. CONCERT guidelines are for um, uh, clinical experiments, for human experiments. Uh, there's the um, uh, Medical Association guidelines, again, for, um, uh, for various other um, types of experiments. The Landis et al. criteria, which is uh, really coming from NIH. 
So NIH wants you to actually address some of these different things. So for example, things like um, inclusion and exclusion criteria, that's something that needs to be uh, listed here. Your randomization, blinding, and power analysis are actually required for all of these different types of guidelines. This is not an ex exhaustive list of guidelines, um, but certainly uh, this is a, a large list. And it turns out that a lot of these, these kinds of things like, you know, how did you select your subjects? Did you properly randomize into groups? Did you blind? These are all things that are expected to be reported, you know, across, um, across this. And the question is why? Why would it be important to actually um, uh, tell people about this? Well, one of the answers is here, right? So here's our blinded conduct of experiment. And if you look at this thing right here, um, this is, uh, again, coming from the stroke literature, but we will we'll show if this, um, if this actually generalizes to other types of literature. So this is based on 11 different publications, 29 different experiments with four, uh, 408 different animals. Now, there is a properly blinded section, and this is the efficacy of the um, of the intervention for stroke. And then here are the non-blinded studies. And you can see that it's basically twice as big. The effect size is twice as big. And if you remember back to that original Frode study, the experiments on the animals that were supposed to be maze dumb, right? Maze dull are actually half the size of the maze bright animals. Wow, I wonder if that's a coincidence. So it looks like that same Frode study, Rosenthal and Frode from 1963 is being repeated over and over again, at least in the stroke literature. And unfortunately, this you know, properly controlled study, the effect is much smaller than the non-properly controlled study. That's also true for Alzheimer's disease studies when they were looked at multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. And I would be willing to bet although I don't know for sure that your disease is also affected by this kind of investigator bias. Okay, oh, I got the slide in the wrong place, that's fine. So our next section of things that we're gonna talk about are this keeping track of enough stuff in our methods. And really Lenny is gonna go through a lot more of this. So I am going to just deal with the reagent part. And the reagent part, the way that I think of the reagents is just like this wonderful recipe here. There is a list of stuff that I need to get or buy from the store, right? I need to find it in my cabinet or I need to figure out what I need to buy. I need a list. And that list you probably have taken in high school chemistry. The first thing that they tell you is what are the things that you need and you need to write those down. Well, guess what? Now you're doing a bigger study, right? Did you write down all the stuff that you need to get in a table? Wouldn't that be nice to just have it kind of in a table? I, I, I think it'd be nice. Um, some journals also think that it would be really nice. Um, so for me, the first step of any study is the materials. Okay, now this is what a paper looks like in practice, right? So here's the first thing that somebody got and it, they called it a NOD PK skid IL2 receptor gamma chain null mouse, which they purchased from Jackson Laboratories in Bar Harbor. Very important. If you're ever in Bar Harbor, you can get this mouse. So the problem with this particular description of this mouse is that it does not exist because most people are going to go to the Jackson Labs website and they're going to type in this search term. And what they're going to get back is either a lot of mice or no mice. They're never going to get to one mouse. And that's a problem because then we fail to communicate which animal we used at step one, right? And that's a problem. So if someone found your paper and we're, you know, you're going to go through this next week, but if someone found the paper that you're going to be looking at, would they know which reagents were used? The lasting artifact is the paper or you know, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to find out the lasting artifact is also the protocols.io protocol. But 
that artifact that is published, it has a DOI, that artifact needs to have the information in it about the reagents used. So we're going to do this and I'm going to just run through a couple more slides on this. But essentially, we found out from Vasilevsky in 2013 that about half the time you cannot find the reagents used. And that is very, very sad. Um, in fact, and I'm just going to go through this, the kinds of things that NIH is trying to say is pay more attention to these sorts of methods, especially the key reagents that actually will vary from lab to lab, things like antibodies and cell lines. Some of you are using cell lines, I know that. Some of you will be using antibodies in your, um, in your experiments. Those also have a lot of problems with them. I'm gonna run really quickly through just a couple of problems with cell lines. So um, this is Christopher Korch. He is a fighter for cell lines that are actually uh, for the you know reducing the use of bad and contaminated cell lines which does happen um, and he and some of his colleagues had founded an a, a um, an organization called ICLAC which is the International Cell Line Authentication Committee um, and what they do is they put together a whole list and a bunch of instructions about how to know that you're actually using the right cell line, that it hasn't mutated and changed its characteristics. And there are various ways to know that. First of all, you have to actually sequence the cell line as it comes into the lab. You do that again um, sometime during the experiment and then at the end of the experiment so that you can know that you're still working on the same cell line. Um, so there's, there's the idea that you have to do some spot checks to make sure that it's still the same biological material. They, they shift, they change. And if you have HeLa cells anywhere in your lab, they will change into HeLa cells. It's a very common problem. One of the other common problems that people don't realize is that some of these cell lines have come into the repositories already with problems. And there's a whole list of these things. There is nearly a thousand of these cell lines um, that are actually now listed. They're pre-contaminated or they have some other problems that people are often not aware of. Hep G2 cell line is one of the ones that um, you know, you'll probably be using because there's a lot of, that's a liver cancer cell line. It was originally thought to be a hepatocarcinoma. Now it's known to be a hepatoblastoma or the other way around, I can't remember but we can look it up in the, um, in the uh, uh, list of, of um, problematic cell lines in, in DKNet. So here is a way that you would know that. Um, so you would go to DKNet, you would search for your favorite cell line that you're using. And in this case, I've searched for the 15C4 cell line. And the thing that I see here is that there's a note that says this is a problematic cell line. It's been contaminated. It's actually been shown to be a HeLa derivative. This is a problem. You want to, because you thought you were testing this cell line, but in fact, you're testing a different cell line. Or you thought that you were testing for one disease, but you're actually testing for another disease. This is a problem. And the question is, how much of the literature that you're reading is being affected by this particular problem? And the answer is unfortunately quite a bit. So in our analysis of, again, uh, over a million papers, there were 150,000 papers that we found that had um, used cell lines. And of those 150,000 papers, 16% had, had used one of the cell lines that was actually marked on the contaminated um, or otherwise problematic list. Um, sometimes that was just fine. Sometimes it was really not fine. When we looked at papers that used um, the RID, so basically people who had consulted the list and then found out exactly how to cite this, and the citation is here. Um, so it's this RID CVCL 22. So if they put that number in, they're getting that from us or they're getting that from the uh, host database, which in this case is Cellosaurus. Um, the idea is that this is the proper way to cite this cell line. And if they did that, they presumably saw this, this uh, comment that this is a problematic cell line. And then they would have a way to think about, hey, how do, do we want to do this? And the answer was only 5% of the time did they actually use one of the problematic cell lines. 
And in fact, when we looked a lot deeper into this data, there was only one that was using a truly contaminated. Most of the rest of these were like Hep G2, which just um, had a different disease initially associated with it than, uh, than was the actual disease that the cell line was, um, was uh, uh, had. And you know, for that, you can imagine that this happens a lot. Right, doctors will misdiagnose all the time, especially for different kinds of cancer. Yeah, you know you have cancer, but which one? That's a question. But with a cell line, they come from patients, right? That patient could have been misdiagnosed. So um, you want to be able to, you know, once these cell lines get sequenced and people really find out, no, 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 it's actually that kind of a cancer and not this kind of cancer. You want to know what that you know, most recent state is of that particular cell line, because again, you might be doing an experiment um, on the wrong cancer. It's, it's a problem. Okay, so um, I am not going to go through the rest of this because my time appear, apparently is up. Thank you so very much for listening, and I look forward to next week.